Hi class, today I'm going to be talking about data visualization. If you remember the SEMA methodology that we follow in data science, sample from data sets, explore data sets, modify the data, create the models, and then compare and assess the models. Uh, then today we have arrived at exploring the data sets. Okay. In the tutorial that I'll give you for the next class, we'll actually be doing some parsing and web crawling so that you can create your own data set. So we'll talk more about that uh, there. But for today, we're going to be looking at some of the design principles of vi creating visualizations uh, and how to go about that. You're all familiar with this statement. A picture says more than a thousand words. If you were to describe this using pixel data, using a few sentences, there's really no way to really convey how this looks except with the picture. So we want to leverage this and use pictures to create, to, to convey information and patterns that may not be so apparent by just looking at numbers. Okay, pretty straightforward. Right, so the same principle goes for graphs. This is a graph of the world population in 1950, 2017 and projected for 2100. Um, it becomes very apparent from this graph that the number of older people is on the rise. So looking at this top, this becomes a lot broader. With just looking at the graph, you immediately see how there's been an expansion of certain age groups and how we actually have become older in general overall really seems very clear from this graph that you can convey a lot of information really quickly. All right. So why do we visualize in data science? So really to understand the data and to derive information from them. If we're doing data analysis like this, what I say we derive information, but really what we are thinking of is perhaps we can think of information or patterns that we didn't know before and that we want to prove using our models. Okay. Second uh, objective of data visualization is communication. This is very important if you're a data scientist and you want to show your management what you've done. Create some nice graphs. It's going to say so much more than if you sh show them some Python code of these are my models. <clears throat> what people want to see is graphs and visuals. Yeah. Let's have a look at some classic charts. So here is Napoleon's uh, 1869's March, which has been referred to as the best statistical graphic ever drawn. I'm not sure if that's uh, really still the case. However, it has five variables on there. It starts uh, here in Kono and it goes all the way to Moscow. It has the army size. The army size is simply the width of this uh, band and it is also displayed in the side as well. Okay, so it seems to decrease quite a lot. Okay, so army size, location, obviously this is a geographical map. The dates. Okay, the date is indicated here and this time chart at the bottom. Then we have uh, the direction. Well, it's basically uh, whenever something is part of his army split and where they go, we see this how and where they're walking. The temperature um, here is pretty grim. Minus 26, minus 11, minus 21 degrees. So this really is the reason why uh, they did not perform very well because simply they didn't have food, they didn't have uh, too much shelter and it was extremely, extremely cold. We're talking minus 21, 26 degrees temperatures here. Okay. Uh, during their re retreat, they followed the black line. And as you see, by the end, there are not many soldiers left, unfortunately. Oh, the temperature that's below is actually during the retreat. So you can study this graph. There's actually a lot to it. 
Here's another chart, which is the baby name Voyager. Okay, let's have a look at that. Here we have the baby name wizard website. This is mostly to show you what interactive graphs uh, can, bring to, can bring you. So because this graph is interactive, it's able to give you so much information all in one graph. Okay, let's see. We can move our mouse over and we'll see the popularity of all these baby names. Mm, let's see, yeah, they don't have Doreen. Right, so I'm just gonna take a random one. Here is Michael. We see from the graph that it was not popular in the early 1900s. It became popular around the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, not so popular now. If, if we click, we see a little bit more information. Um, we see, for instance, again, that it becomes popular in this area and that it's becoming popular for girls as well, be it Michaela or I think the new Star Trek has a Michael uh, female character in it as well. Right, so just to show you that giving, making graphs interactives allow you to display so much information just in one simple looking graph, and that's what you want to achieve. Okay. All right. Here's another famous demonstration from the New York Times. This is the recession recovery of 2014. We probably have another one of those coming. Uh, let's have a look at this graph. Okay, here we go. So this is interesting. So it says five years since the end of the Great Recession, the economy has finally regained the nine million jobs it lost. Okay, so it actually is a little bit of an older chart, right? Each line shows how the number of jobs has changed for a particular industry over the past 10 years. Scroll down to see how the recession reached job market. Okay, we can do that later. So each of these lines are sectors, job market. Nail salons went up. Human resources went down. Oil and gas went up. This is a very interesting uh, graph because it shows you so much information again on one graph, which is what we're aiming to do so. Which is what we're aiming for. Now, if we scroll down, they'll give us a little bit more of a breakdown, which is, I like very much. <clears throat> it's going to highlight certain um, industries and sectors altogether. Okay. So this is a really cool way of visualizing what's happening. It's very unique. Okay. That's why I'm showing it to you. I mean, in general, all of these things, we're going to be s having a lab where we practice a little bit with Matplotlib and maybe Plotly, but Really, if you want to stand out to your manager, to your boss, try to design a graph and show your information in a unique way. This will give you a lot more credits. Okay. Okay. So we can keep going at this. All right. Back to the slides. Right. So what we're going to go over with you is uh, some best practices when designing graphs. Whenever we want to make a graph, try to start with a question. What information are you trying to communicate? What is the goal of your visualization? Then you'll want to ask you what data you have available. What kind of detail do you need to go down to? Do you need to have detailed graphs separate? Can it be interactive like we saw with the baby names? Uh, and how can you use other data to supplement your data? This is also kind of an ingenu ingenuous thing where you can show that you go beyond. You don't just take a data set, you merge your data set with something else, then your approach is going to be that more unique. Okay, so let's go over some of the core principles. Okay, this may all sound basic, but we are in a design school, so we're going to look at some of the design principles. Okay. Reduce clutter. Even though you have this new software that makes your graphs look 3D, don't add unnecessarily uh, lines or 3D if you don't need to, right? Nice and simple, like the right-hand side, conveys the information just as well and maybe even better than the other table. Okay. So just beware. Y do you need shadows? Do you need the 3D if it's not helping the information? Uh, do you need any complex animation if it's not conveying 
animation, uh, uh, really a data feature. So if just ask yourself, does this extra decoration add more information? Does it reveal more information or not? Okay. In general, just reduce table junk. Okay, so we talked about this dynamically reveal some structure or features can really help you uh, to uh, reduce the clutter in your graph, but still keep all the information in there. We have some encoding schemes that we can use as well. So what does this mean? In my graph, I can use things like the position to show elements. Geographical position would be the easiest, but it can be a scatter plot, for instance. We can use the length of lines to make a distinction. We can use the angle in pie charts. We can use connected elements or not. We can make things sloped or not. Change the area, the size, the volume of something. The shape for categorical data or contain them in groups. Okay. Then we also have color schemes, right? So we can change the density, saturation, the hue, so making it a totally different color, or use different textures. Okay. Not all of these are equally good to use. Some of them are more accurate. Okay. What does this mean? The position of elements is the most accurate. Okay, something is here, something is there. You realize it's somewhere different. Length is also pretty clear. You can easily see how much they differ if it's the same difference. Angle can be okay as well, a bit less clear maybe because it becomes harder to perceive. The area is a lot less easy to see as we'll demonstrate in a minute. Volume is even harder. And then colors and density all have their own problems, as we'll look at in a, in a minute. The area. Tell me, how much bigger is the right image? Think about this. Is it four times bigger? You think it's four times bigger? No? Okay. Those of you who thought it was four times bigger, it is not four times bigger. Okay. So using area makes it actually quite hard to estimate just how much times is element B bigger or smaller than element A. Right. So that's why we don't really consider it to be accurate to represent data. Okay. Here's another one. Which one is brighter? And how much brighter is it? Can you really quantify that? Is it 10% brighter? Okay. can be quite unclear. For those of you interested, this, these are the color values that we use. So the right one is a little bit brighter. So when we're using uh, brightness to, to indicate different elements, uh, then we can really say that the ratios are more important than the actual magnitude, right? The fact that it's 144 in the previous uh, image, really, that's not something we know. However, we might be able to say, if we have this scale, this legend, that this is maybe double as bright as that one compared to this one, you know. Maybe if we divide this into chunks, we might be able to use it. However, it remains a little bit elusive. Okay. Here's another word of caution. Sorry, the image is a little bit blurred here. Be careful with 3D, and especially 3D and pie charts. Okay. In this case here, we have, now it looks a little bit like a smiley face. Now we have, uh, it's probably 120 degree angle. Okay, so all of the elements are equal. What if we flip the pie chart and make it 3D? Does it still look like this one is equal and one third of the pie? No, it doesn't because 3D deforms your images. Okay. So whenever you can avoid 3D, really do so. It's not considered to be good practice to do pie charts in 3D. Right, this reiterates the statement. Here you have um, 
<clears throat> some elements. It could be a TSNE projection, something we'll see later on. Um, the same three groups of clusters of points uh, are represented from a different perspective. So notice how in this perspective it looks like these elements are all close together. Here it sort of looks like they're equi equidistant. Here these are more close. You know, using 3D can really screw up, mess up your perspective. Okay. So what works better? Just project each of the axes separately. I know it's a lot more data, but that's the only way you're getting a real accurate perception. Unless you make your graph interactive and make it turn around so people can actually see it. Okay. So this would be, on the right, would be the better solution. So another design principle in, I would say, increase your data to ink ratio. What does that mean? To the same graphs on the top and the bottom, depicting the exact same thing. The top one has a lot of ink, right? It has the frame, it has the background. It's really all not necessary. It has a little border around the legend, not necessary. Okay, so make it just nice so the data really pops up. Yeah. Less inked, if you can. So basically, unavo avoid sorry unnecessary containment of legends and borders around graphs if you really don't need to. If you need them for access labels, that's a different story. You really need them. So avoid heavy access. Avoid error bars and, and glyphs if you don't need them. Okay. okay. There's a lot of things to avoid here. This is another uh, image talking about chart junk, something we started with. Um, there's no need to have all these lines. Take something that's more clear to, to separate these bar charts here. For instance, just use gray values. Here in the bottom, we have three di four different elements, and the elements are varied in both the shape and the color. There's no need to change both the shape and the color because it might people might here think that these two elements actually have some similar properties and they may not. So just use color and be done with it. Mm -hmm. Lots of different colors together it can also be confusing for reasons that we'll mention in the next slide. Uh, so try to be concise. Right, so when you use color Check uh, something called Brewer palettes. You might you might have heard about this. Brewer palettes are palettes that have a range of colors based based on the HSV model, which makes life easier for us because it makes sure that there's a, a big contrast or noticeable difference between these colors. Okay. So avoid the huge the use of hue because that really doesn't doesn't work very well. In these Brewer palettes. Brewer palettes, sorry, we have different types of color schemes. Color schemes will have colors that match together nicely visually, but also work well to represent uh, data. So depending on the type of data, you might have um, qualitative data, separate uh, classes that have nothing to do with each other. Okay. So then you just give them very different colors, each of them. Um, if you have sequential data, you can use a color scheme like this one. It goes from light to dark. If you have divergent da data, let's say um, whereby the, this side of the spectrum is very different than that side. They're like opposite, but they're related, they're opposite. Then you can use one of the diverging color s schemes. So something to consider, don't just use the standard color schemes, but have a, have a think about what makes sense for your data. Right, so what, which letters do you see in this graph? It's really too bad that um, we're not in class because we always have a, a few people who don't see any of this uh, and because they're colorblind. Okay. 10 to 20% of the, percent of the population are red, green, colorblind. So I see 74, I think, is there another number to be seen? Uh, probably 74, 21 maybe. Okay, um, colorblind happens mostly with men, 
but one in 200 of women will also be colorblind. Okay. What happens is uh, basically what falls out the red and the green of the color spectrum sort of dampens and they're not able to see it. Okay. So when you're making graphs, please don't use red and green uh, labels. It's something we might not think about, but 10, 20% of people may not see what you're, what you're meaning. And if your boss is colorblind, he might not want to admit it to you. So that's just, or he might not even know that you're using black and, uh, sorry, green and red. Okay, so um, you can actually wonder why people made traffic lights red and green, right? So I have some friends, my cousin actually is colorblind and he just, he just memorizes, he knows the top light is the green one and the red light is the bottom one. That's it, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so back to charts. We should integrate the text and the graphics. Okay, so when people read research papers, I need to read a lot of research papers to stay on top of things and people don't read the entire research paper always. What you do is there's a way of reading it where you read the abstract, then you scroll through to see the titles and the graphs, then you do another pass and you start reading more and more. So there's certain ways to read papers, for instance. The same goes for reports. People, people's eye go to the graphs and when they look at the graphs, they want to be able to understand the graph without having to look where in the text the graph is cited and explained. So graphs should really be self-explanatory. And the way you do that is by integrating text in them. Okay. So it will make them stand alone. Always, always, always put the access label. Okay. I can't tell you how many times students come to me and they have been working for two weeks straight, working hard to optimize the training of their neural network or whatever and they show me a graph that they're very proud of they've worked a lot on and it's sort of a line and it goes down right and they just start explaining explaining to me and they don't tell me what the axis labels are okay so it's something that because you've worked a lot with this data it doesn't mean that the other people know what your chart is going to look like so always always put your axis labels I know it's sort of a hassle because in Python you have to be like set access label and you have to type it, but still it saves you work. Also afterwards, if you come back to the graph and you've forgotten what it might have been, it has labels so you can understand it. Okay. So there's some Gestalt principles that we can uh, find in psychology. And they really say that the whole is more than the sum of its part because our eyes detect a limited set of visual characteristics we unconsciously group them. So also keep this in mind that um, <clears throat> we can use grouping to, um, to make our data clear. So if we have elements here that are colored, our eyes will conceive them, consider them as groups. Uh, this will be seen as groups. Uh, this will probably be perceived as a rectangle while it is not a rectangle. And this will be considered as a circle because we have this principle of closure. Right. So just keep in mind that you perceive holistically based on these principles. So it's important that uh, if any of these things are present in your graphs, you know that people will perceive them as a whole. Okay, so we have something called pre-attentive processing. Uh, what is perceived without dedicated attention? Okay. This is related to the previous thing. We can make things stand out in very basic ways make give it a give it a border change the symbol uh, put a box around it give it color change the saturation make it 3d however these kinds of graphs are not graphs that i often see in my classes so it's worth to think about how can we actually sharpness that's a nice one um, how can we actually change dense cluster of things change the properties of one of the elements to make it stand out more if you want it to draw attention. Okay. All right. So we've almost made it through all of the design principles. 
So whenever you present data, always think who is your audience? How detailed do they want to see the data? Do they have technical background? Do you have to break it down? Sometimes it doesn't work well to impress your audience using uh, fancy words and acronyms. Oh my gosh, they use so many acronyms here in Singapore. Um, it's one of Elon Musk's principles. He sent a very angry memo about that once. He does not allow their, the employees to use acronyms. And the very simple reason is that whenever somebody is talking about an acronym in a meeting, maybe half the people don't understand what he's talking about, but nobody is going to dare to ask because they might look foolish. Okay. And this happens to me as well. And I feel like in Singapore, they use so many acronyms. Oh my gosh. So be considerate, always explain your acronyms or just avoid them if you don't want them, okay? if you don't really need them. Okay, so avoid acronyms as a side, but um, also make sure if they don't have that much technical background, try to simplify things. Being able to take a complex uh, thing and explain it in an easy way is actually a sign of intelligence, so your boss will actually recognize that. All right, some other pointers. Break up complicated graphs, right, as here. If you have something that's not clear, just make it clear in simple graphs. It's okay to have more graphs if they are more clear. Your label should be readable and um, include annotation uh, or, or tell them where to look. Okay, that's not illustrated in the graphs, but it sort of goes with what we just saw. Here's an interesting point. What if um, we represent our data like this versus like that? Okay, starting zero versus starting at the last common point. So depending on what you want to achieve, um, on the left side A, seems like there's a huge difference between these two. Uh, the right side seems like only a minor difference. Same data, just different access labels. Okay. So if you want to manipulate people a little bit, use the A solution. If you want to be more honest, use B. But there might be valid reasons for using A. You just need to make sure that you clearly state that your axis starts from 60. Make the axis readable. Similar to this, um, when we have a graph these two graphs, for instance. What is the difference between, let's say, this bar and this bar? It seems like they're almost the same, but they are not. Why? Because the axis labels are different. Okay. So if you make, want to make the comparison of these graphs more honest, the way you put it is by using something like this. Okay. This allows for a much easier comparison. All right. So Make a sketch before you design anything or draw anything or program anything. Make a little sketch to know how it should look like. Okay. This saves you a lot of time. I find that whenever you're doing user interface design or um, you're doing uh, PowerPoint slides even, sometimes I just like to have my notebook and I'll make a drawing. Okay, now these were the design principles. Let's talk about some common graphs. Okay, this may seem basic, but I need to make sure that you know what these graphs are. I try to put in as many interesting graphs as I could find. Here's a chloroplath. Okay, these are graphs that divide a country into grief, a country or geographical area into sub areas that are colored, shaded or patterned related to a data variable. Okay, now this is France and this shows us, um, does it show? See, this is why you need a legend, which I didn't include. It shows the population in different areas of France. Okay. Now, there are some downsides to this. You don't know how much the actual values are unless you hover over and make the graph interactive. Um, then there's another common error and that is actually a quite uh, important error is that people encode the raw values. Let's say <clears throat> 
here is where is Paris is here. So it looks like the population of Paris is not that much. Okay. Why is that? Because they're using the population and not the population per square meter. And as you know, there are a lot of people living in Paris, but on the outskirts is actually some beautiful nature. Uh, I, uh, I love going to a place right here, which is Fontainebleau, which is a uh, bouldering paradise if you're into climbing. I really like climbing. Uh, this is where I got married as well. And so these big areas full of forest make it that the average, so that the total population um, goes down a bit. Okay. So this is not really indicative of the actual population. It seems like in the south here are way more populated areas. So what can we do to make this representation a little bit more fair? Is use something like dot grid maps. Now it becomes very clear that Paris here is a place to be. Okay. Because these dot grid maps allows us to change the density according to the actual normalized per area population. Okay. All right, so we're actually not going to practice um, geographical maps, but if you're interested in that, there's a lot of nice software like Tableau that can help you with this. Uh, for maps, usually people use more of a graphical interface. Uh, there's ways to do it in Python too, though. Right, so we also have cartograms. There's the last of our map types. Cartograms actually distort the geometric geometry or the space of a map to convey the information. So in this uh, example, we have an area cartogram that changes the area of countries like Australia, uh, here became huge, to indicate the amount of organic farming per country. As you can see, Australia does a lot of organic farming, China not so much, UK a little bit, France a lot, Spain a lot, okay, and then it becomes hard to see Italy a lot. It's a bit distorted, so I'm not sure I'm such a fan of this area. There's also a thing called distance cartogram that um, actually is going to change the distance between countries. Okay. All right, so let's look at another type of data, temporal data. Here is the Tesla stock price. Oh, really? This is really old. Um, really old, two years ago, I should replace this. Um, as you know, there has been a Tesla stock split, uh, so it's now divided by five, and we're actually around the same range, again, of data two year, as two years ago, but because there was a stock split. Um, so that aside, here is a, a connected scatter plot, sort of like a time series, the most common way to, uh, to represent time data. Here is an area chart I like area chart. Um, my preference personally, of course, depending on the data, would be the stacked area charts, which sort of overlays different of these time plots um, so that you can see the relation between them right away. It allows for very easy comparison of data. Um, as you can see, everything. In the first one, uh, it's also cool, but uh, because of the, you see, uh, some is in the background because it's occluded a little bit. So this is an area chart. Then we have arc diagrams. As I told you, most of my research is in music. So um, as you can see, and this is actually a very difficult problem, structure and repetition in music is what make musical pieces sound good. If you have an earworm, something you know that you keep uh, singing over and over in your head or hearing over and over, is because it's repeated a lot in a song. And how do we represent this? we can use something called arc diagrams. In this case, this whole pattern here is repeated here. Okay. And it's nicely visualized. You can even do it for individual notes. It doesn't just work on music, it works on other data types as well. All right, okay, let's look at multidimensional data. Okay, we have pie charts, as you know already. It's not good custom to put a pie chart in 3D. Um, Pie charts, 
I mean, this is basic. We have our data divided into sections and you have the proportion. I like always putting the percentage there and you'll have a legend or write in the, the, the legend in the actual pie. More, slightly more interesting is the radar spider chart uh, here. It's often useful at sports and budgets, uh, but in this case, it is the performance of different car types, right? So we have Chrysler, Kia, Mazda, Mercedes, and Saab, and this is also a little bit older data, but it shows you um, in the evolution it seems that Kia used to be the fastest performance from 0 to 60 in seconds. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Performance 0 to 60 in seconds means we actually want a low value, meaning Mazda had the best value. Then 1980, 1998, best performer, what is it? Maybe. I see a downside of this particular graph is that I don't know where 14 is here. Okay, right, so I would improve that graph and add some more legends. Um, axis ticks, I mean. And then clearly the best performer after, oh, no, one, two, three. It's a tie, it's Mazda and Kia performed best in 2004. Okay, um, this kind of chart is also used for player statistics, like in cricket for instance. Um, we use it in gamification as well. As you know, I'm director of Game Lab, and we have something called an octalysis analysis of games where we have these spider charts. And when you're thinking of designing your game, you create this chart and it'll have like uh, different characteristics that you want to achieve, like uh, interactivity, social awareness, uh, violence, uh, whatever and you'll, you'll make a profile of the type of game that you want to achieve. Yeah, if you're interested in that, just look up Octalysis. Okay. All right, usually it's used when you have more than five values that you need to compare and visualize. I personally think it's a quite dynamic chart, so it's pretty cool. Histogram, I mean, this is a basic one from your statistics class. It shows the distribution of data. Um, it uses rectangles, uh, which have a bin size. The bin size is the width of your rectangles here. And this also drastically changes how your histogram looks. This particular one shows two histograms combined of blood pressure, the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. Very often in histograms, we use this to show there's a normal distribution of data and we find these Gaussian curves. So if you're making histograms, experiment with different bin sizes. It can actually quite drastically change how your data looks. Another classic is a scatter plot. Just displays values for two variables um, of, set of, of a set of data. In this case, we have weight versus height. This seems to be of humans, small humans. <laughs> I don't know who's one meter high, it must be children. Um, two, two meters high. And yeah, not too bad body mass index here. Okay, so scatter plot. A little bit more advanced would be a bubble chart. Bubble chart is able to display many more dimensions. Okay. Yeah, this particular um, bubble chart is one from my research on um, dance hit prediction. I like it because this was done with Google API. Uh, it was called a motion chart in Google API. And uh, it has many, many variables. So first it allows you to select which variable you want on the loudness, uh, sorry, on the X and the Y axis. In this case, we have music duration, so the length of a song and the loudness of a song. And these would be all the hit songs. Um, yeah, the hit songs from uh, that particular year, this year is 2012. We can actually play the timeline and the bubbles will move over the chart to show the characteristics in time. There is another variable, which is the size of the button the buckle, bubble. The size of the bubble is the timbre. 
and the color is the tempo tempo so red ones would be fast songs so mostly slow songs okay. it's cool to see the evolution over time i seem to have a problem with my api i think i need to update uh, my code and my api developer key um, i'll see if i can do that so you can click the website bubble charts do not need to have this time series dimension basically they are scatter plots which have an additional volume or color uh, dimension to add a yet another date another variable to your data representation all right this leaves us with hierarchical data here we have ring diagrams this one is from the daisy disk software which is actually quite cool it'll tell you how the space on your hard disk is used so this would be my um, my root folder this is my home directory folder these are some system folders within the home folder i have everything in another folder and this folder is split into dropbox here and others others each of them are split up again so i really like this, this is a very nice uh, dynamic uh, dynamic visualization of hierarchical data. You can try it yourself, it's, it's quite nice. If you click uh, one of the rings, you'll actually zoom in more and get more details. There's tree diagrams, pretty simple. Tree diagrams, um, also called dendrograms, and they're nice for representing clusters. In this case, we are representing types of cars, and we see that there's clusters based on these properties that sort of belong Together we have Lincoln and Cadillac together, and we have Mercedes and Mazda sort of together. Mm, okay, right. So you read this from the left to the right, and um, it forms a hierarchical structure. It's pretty straightforward. There are also network diagrams, network diagrams such as the alluvial diagram. This particular one shows um, the number of citations of scientific fields over time. Okay. Each significance clustering for the citation networks in the years 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007 occupies a column in the diagram and uh, is horizontally connected to preceding and succeeding significance clusters by stream fields. Each block in a column represents a field and the height of the block reflect citation flow through the field. Okay. So here you see that citations of molecular bio in my molecular biology actually refer to neuroscience and that papers in medicine, for instance, will partially cite molecular and cell biology and also, what is this one? Infectious diseases, etc. So it's a nice flow diagram. It, it, it shows how things are connected. So this, this is how different papers from different fields cite other different fields. And of course, how many citations and references there are in each field at any given time. So how many citations there are sort of uh, shows you the importance of the field. Okay. So one thing you could see is that neuroscience actually became quite important in 2005. All right, we have node link diagrams. Node link diagrams represent nodes as dots and links as line segments to show how data set is connected. Okay. In this case, what do we have? We have um, an organizational diagram. Okay. This is a network of company sales. We have our executive manager uh, partners are the blue ones and uh, advisors, partners, associates are these. So this graph shows how the uh, who is recruited by who. The size of the ball actually refers to their sales volume. So how many things they sell in the company. In 3D, this is sometimes referred to as a hypergraph. I think there's a very cool Java 3D library hypergraph, which allows you to to make these sort of connections in 3D. Um, right, so we also have a matrix representations. 
also network diagrams because they connect um, multiple variables. This is a diagram that shows the relationship between a few groups of information and gives information about that set relationship. In this case, we have uh, the times of day and the times and the weekdays. And each weekday, we know when something happens. Okay, so it shows a connection between two variables and gives information about what said relationship is about. Okay. In this case, unfortunately, I did not add the legend. And as you see, the graph becomes pretty useless as I do not rep remember what this graph was representing. Okay, okay here is a human genome. They use uh, circus which is a sort of circular representation that shows the repeated genes. Okay, as you know, uh, genes are, have self-similarity and uh, they are repeated within the genome. So this actually shows this is sort of a variant of the ARC diagram. Okay, so Circus, here's a web page, is a software library that allows you to sort of visualize these kind of ring network diagrams on genomes with all sorts of data, really. Um, so I'm not a genome expert, so I can't tell you what these colors represent. But have a look around if this is something that interests you. This, they have some example data on their website. This is a visualization of how customers flow between brands and car segments. Right. Interesting. They go from a luxury car to, well, it's a little bit too small to see. Okay. Customer flow. Okay, here's an example. They go from Chevy to luxury utility. Uh, people use this for urban planning, for political debates, how the preferences flow. The global flow of people. Here is the migration in planet Earth. Also interesting. Okay. So if you're interested in this, check out the software library. Okay. Back to the PowerPoint. I think this is our last example of visualization. Oh. Um, so that just leaves me with um, showing you a few tools that you can use to make visualization. So uh, there is Tableau, which is a very famous presence in data science. There's a big focus on Tableau on business intelligence, uh, the whole business intelligence cockpit idea where you can keep an eye on your, your company by looking at the levers, it's sort of like a cockpit, you know what's going on. However, ta Tableau is also really nice for creating graphs, uh, geographical graphs as well. Okay. There's Python libraries, Matplotlib, no doubt you've already seen Matlotlib in some course. Uh, we are going to do some lab exercises because it's just imperative for our course that you really know how to do this. There are some more interactive libraries like Plotly. We'll also briefly touch this in the lab. Now you can make the Matplotlib uh, look actually really nice and you have some extensions uh, like uh, Python Seaborn Seaborn is uh, meant for statistical plotting, but it comes with a lot of preset styles and color palettes, so you can make it pretty nice. So it's built on top of Matplotlib. So again, it's important. We all know those commands. ggplot. Okay, ggplot um, I have used in the past to do some visualizations for my research. Why? Because it's actually an R plotting system. Uh, you know R. Uh, I don't like R particularly a lot because I think it's quite convoluted uh, and not intuitive to use. Nevertheless, the plot is very pretty and R being a command line interface only, it's known for having one of the nicest graphical outputs, strangely. Um, so ggplot2 gives you very nice uh, graphs using the ggplot R plotting system. It is different than Matplotlib. It lets you layer components to create a complex plot. So you like define the axis, add points, add a line, add scatter dots, etc. 
There's also a GeoplotLib. This is exclusively for geolocation, geographical data, but it is um, quite nice in case you need this. Mapbox, also very intuitive. Uh, this is not Python. However, it's, it can help you create nice web-based visualizations of uh, data with some scripts behind it so you can change different layers. And I have used it in a few capstone projects. It seems to work pretty well. In fact, we even use Mapbox in the latest uh, game from Game Lab Project Pair. So if uh, you're interested in having a look what that looks like, um, we have a geolocation-based game, much like uh, Pokemon, but different focus is on climate change here. And we use Mapbox for the map representation where we send you to find things on a map. Okay. Google chart tools are pretty cool. Um, they, you just need an API key and basically have a URL that you create, put all your data in and bam, you have your graph. It works very, very easily, nothing to install. Um, I, I like these gods, I like graphs as well. Uh, a few years back, one of my colleagues in Antwerp created something called the political barometer, and it basically displayed the output live on graphs using these gauges, and it tells you for different politicians what is the sentiment on social media. I think that was a pretty cool um, application. All right, so that brings us to uh, the upcoming lab. This week's class lecture is a bit shorter because we will be having a guest lecture. I'm still in the process of uh, firming this up. Then we'll have two labs. We'll have um, a, a, a lab on data handling, Unix commands, web parsing, etc. And we will have one on Python 3 basics and Matplotlib. Okay. So um, for this, you just need Google Colab. We will be doing this in person on Wednesday or Thursday, depending on which group you are in. And depending on how long the guest lecture is, I will give you this lab already to prepare at home, which you can do during the second hour of the lecture slot. Okay. More information on this will be on eDimension or the website with the videos. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this brief class on data visualization and hope that you'll find some of these principles useful in your uh, project and your future career.